We're in Paris. It's 1963, and Harold and Lily Chibbert are on a long-awaited holiday. How much further, Harold? Hmm? It's just around the corner, I think, dear. But Chib is chasing a lead. This sweet shop had better be worth it. Oh, yes. If their records confirm they provided the royal family sweets, it will be a key corroboration for Donald's story. Here we are, rue du Bac. It should be... there. Oh. I've had enough, Harold. I know this trip hasn't been... It's more. not the trip. It's the last seven years, literally chasing ghosts. You're obsessed, and it's time to stop. Now, I am going back to the hotel for a long, hot bath, and then tonight, you are taking me to a French restaurant. We're in Paris. They're all French restaurants. Vous êtes perdu, monsieur? Are you lost, sir? I think perhaps I am. This could be it, Shirley. We're finally getting somewhere. What does he want, Chib? Who the hell is he? That's what we're going to find out. But the dead are only half the story. Darkness comes from light. So let's start with the living. Shirley Hitchings, who the hell are you? What are you looking for? I don't know anymore. Chib is deep down the rabbit hole. He spent years chasing a theory that depends on the letters from Donald being genuine. So are they. Hello, Emma. Hi, Danny. So you've now had time to look at the handwriting samples. Have you been able to reach a conclusion? Yes, I have, yeah. Could these letters have been written by the same person? I'm Danny Robbins, and this is the Battersea Poltergeist. Episode 8. Darkness and Light. Shirley, I feel like we've been on this journey together. Yes. I know that you were nervous about opening the box, that we might bring Donald back. All sorts of things go through your mind when you wake up at four o'clock in the morning. What he put me through was horrific and I hated him and still hate him for all that. One side of me, I don't want to stir anything up because, you know, there might be retribution coming. Or am I doing the right thing? I, You know, my mind is very mixed. I, I actually f- feel quite nervous. This is your story that you have lived with for 65 years. It's all right. Because in telling a ghost story, there will be people out there who want to disprove it. Well, feel free. Everybody is entitled. I know, I know, I was only a 15-year-old girl, but I know I wasn't doing it. God, that's creepy. Foxes. I am, of course, in the shed. So the Hitchings were just an ordinary family. But what happened to them back in 1956 was extraordinary. This case has the feel of a locked room mystery. A group of people trapped in a claustrophobic house, surrounded by the nation's press. And the impossible happens. It's a detective story where one of our possible suspects is a ghost. But was it a haunting or a hoax? This 
is our final episode. We're going to assess the evidence, hear the case for both sides and try and give you answers. But I feel like we need to start by just reminding ourselves of our timeline. So I've got some post-it notes here to map it out on the wall. Now we start, remember, with the key. Shirley found it. End of January. 27th. It was on my bed, sitting on the pillow. I'd never seen it before. That object that feels so loaded with symbolism. Is it a gift from Donald? Or just a random object that only seems significant in hindsight? Because it's that night the noises start. After three weeks of sleepless nights, on 18th of February, the first object moves. Ow! Oh. It's Shirley's glove. That same evening, the entire family seemed to witness Shirley floating above her bed. Help me! The newspapers call it levitation. It was like she was hovering, maybe six inches over the bed. 20th of February, the Daily Mirror, one of Britain's biggest newspapers, runs the first article about the case. And then the family are besieged. That week, the first contact is made with Donald. Donald, are you in love with Shirley? It's soon after that that fires start to break out. He's out of control! Ah! What makes this case so unique is that these things are experienced by multiple witnesses. And on that note, there's a new event I want to add to our timeline. Regarding the question of several people witnessing the impossible, it doesn't get stranger than this. I've saved talking about it because, well, whether you're a believer or a skeptic, I think it's arguably the most disturbing thing in this whole case. It involves Shirley's grandmother, Ethel. Dear Lord, protect this family from evil. Watch over us as we are in our hour of need. In the build-up, it's felt like she's being particularly targeted by Donald. I think he tormented her. Dad used to say, he's playing games with you and you're rising to it. Oh. 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 Mum! Oh. Mum, what, what are you doing? Are you OK? He just pushed me down the stairs. You could almost hear a silent laugh because she used to spout sort of the holy mother or what's it to him. He used to get at her. So we're in October 1956, nine months in. Things have been noisy and nasty. Kitty and Wally find their bed doused in alcohol and later smeared with rat poison. Oh. Oh, Wally, would you look? A day blighter. It's now the night of Friday the 19th. We were all in the bedroom because Mum had to be in bed. Dad would be on top of the bed, fully clothed, in case he had to run anywhere. John would be there, and we only had the little light and the firelight going. At around midnight, a message is tapped out on the wall. Get Ethel, please. What the hell is going on now? Who is calling me? Wally's diary records that objects start to fly around them. Wally, what's going on? The room is filled with whispering until... Suddenly there was a voice. And it was an Irish voice of a woman. Who's that? Is that you, Donald? Who is it? Tell me now. And I think John went over and and put his hand round the wall. Nothing. And I was looking at me mum. Who's Sarah? We could hear this voice coming from the corner. How do I know it's you? I have a message for you. No, no, it, it can't be. And. Nan was talking to it. Sweet Jesus. No! Yeah, Mum, it's okay. Come here. There, there. 
So she'd recognised this voice from somewhere. Oh, yeah, she was shaken. I'm going to my room. Who was it, Dad? Who's Sarah? Her mum. I'm with our experts, Kieran O'Keefe and Evelyn Hollow. Kieran, that awful moment where Ethel seems to hear her mum's voice. The whole family are in the room. They can hear it too. When you have multiple viewpoints, of course it lends more weight to an eyewitness testimony, but within forensic psychology, we're well aware of the concept of contagion, which is where a person influences the emotions or behavior of another person and can influence even their reporting of an event. It's not unheard of that somebody has an extreme reaction to what they've seen and everybody has a similar sort of reaction. Okay, so how do you see that working here? This is being really hypothetical, but if, for example, you had somebody that was whispering in that room, effectively just whispering behind their hand, and then you get group conformity kicking in. So somebody says, that sounds like an Irish accent. I could imagine people in that sort of environment thinking, yeah, absolutely it is. It is Irish. I could explain that. I could even explain Ethel going, yes, that's my mother. I think the difficulty we've got is that there is an actual conversation. So Ethel is hearing actual words. Given the huge impact it had on her, Evelyn, it's really hard to see how this voice could have been faked. When we talked about stages of a poltergeist, the very last one is voice phenomena. We can sort of explain away Ethel's experience in terms of yeah, the psychology and the trauma and the torture, but I just cannot work out how on earth somebody managed to do that because it's not just any voice, it's Ethel's mother's voice. She knows that voice personally. For a few days after she went up to her flat, and she wouldn't even come down to watch telly. Mother, come and have some food with us. No, thank you. Did she ever tell you what her mother said to her? No. No, she said that's my mother's voice. Ethel never really recovers from that night. A few months later, Shirley comes home to find an ambulance outside the house. Ethel has had another stroke. Oh, so. Oh, my God! Nan! And as they put her in the ambulance, I got in the ambulance and held her hand. Get well, Nan. Take care of your mother, Shirley. She's to have my sewing machine. Shh. You'll be coming back to us. No, I won't. Take care of yourself, darling. That was Friday night at five o'clock and the policeman came at nine o'clock Saturday morning to say she had died. I feel like I need a breather, so I've just stepped out of the shed to, um, to just kind of gather my thoughts in the garden. This case feels like a labyrinth. Every time that you think you're getting closer to seeing the light, getting closer to an explanation, you turn a corner and suddenly you're plunged back into darkness. I feel like we need to go back to our timeline. So the incident with Ethel's mother is October 1956. And I feel like this marks a definite shift in the case. By autumn of 56, the intense media coverage has died out. When did we last have a journalist round? It's been months, show. They found better things to write about. And the family have started to become familiar with the phenomena, so they're still frightening moments, but it's not that day-to-day -day intense terror that they feel early on. So the second half of the case is the events that we saw last episode, episode seven, Chib's quest to prove Donald is the Dauphin, Louis Charles, the family's strange domestic setup with Donald, what I call supernatural Stockholm syndrome. And of course, the letters. So, Emma, I'm just getting the two handwriting samples up now. Are you looking at them too? Yes, I am looking at them in front of me, yeah. Last episode, I gave handwriting expert Emma Bache those two letters, one from Shirley and one supposedly from Donald, both sent to Chib on the same day. She now has her results. 
So just firstly, is handwriting unique? Is it like fingerprints? Totally. Yes, it absolutely is. Handwriting is, if you like, a microcosm of the personality. So our personality, if you like, is directed onto the paper, whether it's small or large, the spaces between the words, the pressure. As well as giving you those two key samples, I shared a selection of other letters written by Donald over a period of time. What did you make of them? I would say all of them have enormous embellishment and curlicues on, and there's a lot of artifice. When you say artifice, explain that more to me. Well, if somebody has decided to put lots of curlicues and additions, it's nearly always a facade. It's a cover-up to try and hide the real personality. So let's focus in on our two samples. Let's take Shirley's first. Right, well, Shirley, like Donald, has a severe left slant and there are very wide spaces between the words. In fact, there are quite wide spaces between the letters. This is somebody who doesn't feel as though they are part of a group. They would come across as being friendly and uh, sociable, but the reality is far from it and they feel themselves very isolated. And next to it, we have Donald's letter. Well, I think this letter is, um, it's highly stylized. But I think that, again, there's artifice, there's spelling mistakes, there's transposing of letters, there's pronglet going between French and English. It's, it's almost somebody showing off um, their bilingual abilities. And uh, it's, it's, a, it's a scream for attention. I hardly dare ask this. And... I've got to admit that I am really, really hoping that you say no. But could these two letters have been written by the same person? I would say they almost certainly have. Gosh. The chances of these two letters having been written by different people are remote enough for me to say I'm certain they've been written by the same writer. I'm certain they've been written by the same writer. Oh. What, me? Yeah, so Emma feels that you wrote both letters. I, I hate to spring this on you like this, No, Jim. but it's got to be spoken about. So do you think it's possible? No. Definitely not. Definitely not. How do you explain the fact that a handwriting expert says she thinks that they were written by the same person? Have you got any feelings on that? No, no. Other than he could have been taking me over. The thoughts of that is, that to me is sick. I wasn't conscious of it ever, ever. And uh, that part of it worries me to this day. When you look at Donald's writing, Shelley, do you see a similarity to yours? No, I see a very ornate curly writing I'm finding this such a hard one it is it is I, I have been there because the press they took me to this psychiatrist and he was saying own up you were doing it you were doing all the writing and I even then I was saying no 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 you know I, I don't know how to get it over I know it wasn't me. So you do feel that there is a possibility that you could have been doing this somehow unconsciously? Well, it could have been, but I don't know when. <laughs> because I was always in the vicinity of my mother. She never let me out my sight. And I was never left alone. And then... When we did get the deluge and Chib was getting 16 messages a day, I was at work and I was in an office. In, where did I have the time to write 60 letters and whiz them back to Wycliffe Road? <laughs> so I know it wasn't me, consciously. It's interesting you said consciously. Yes, yeah. So you still have a little worry in your head that it, it is possible that it could have been unconscious. I think it's important because I'm, you know, professing that it wasn't me and I know I'm sure, but am I sure? 
I know in my conscious mind, sitting here now, it was not me. Oh, I don't think I've ever felt so awkward and uncomfortable in a conversation before. And I think we just all need to take a moment to process that. We said the letters were weird, but they're weird on so many levels. So Emma is an expert in her field, and I have no doubt that she is correct. Shirley did write the letters. And yet, there are so many things that don't quite make sense about it. There are, we estimate, a between three and 4,000 written communications from Donald over the 12 years. At some points, there are as many as 60 in a day. We've seen the impact this had on the family, particularly on the health of Wally and Ethel. They cannot possibly have suspected Shirley, so how did she get away with it? Any ghost story stands or falls on the person telling it. To be fair to Chip, he didn't trust Shirley blindly. After that incident with Collie Kibber and the Radio Times last episode, he writes, At first sight, it looks as though fraud was operated here. After that, he would test Shirley by taking home the only key to one of the rooms in the house. When he returned the next day, there would be letters inside the room. Chib was convinced there were some things that Shirley faked, but he wrote, this must be seen in relation to the whole case, which is a strange mixture of the apparently genuine and false. So I'm going through all the notes in Chib's cardboard box and, you know, it, you can see leaping off the page in his neat handwriting, this mixture of excitement, confusion, desperation, trying to answer that question, who is Donald? We know from these files that the family continued to experience phenomena until 1964 when they finally move out of number 63 big moment, Wally and Kitty have saved enough to buy their own place. But even in their new house on Latchmere Road, just about 15 minutes walk away, activity continues, much more sporadically, but it's still there. Shirley's in her 20s now, grown up, and on 20th of March 1965, she marries her boyfriend Derek. Come over here, Dad. John's going to take a group photo. Come on, Wally. Yeah, all right, all right. Get your mum in too, Shell. Oh, nobody wants to see me. It's almost exactly nine years since Chib first arrived at number 63. Congratulations, Shirley. Chib, thanks for coming. Ah, oh, of course, of course. The lovely canopies. Mum and Dad say you've been going over to see them still. Mm. They appreciate it. Well, Donald may not appear so often these days, but we must continue to document the case. I know, I know you had your moments when you thought it was me. Yes, but for every moment of suspicion, there have been many more that make me believe. That's the nature of the paranormal. Doubt and wonder. A two-pronged path. We must all choose our route. Oh, I've been meaning to give you this for a long time. A postcard I picked up in Paris. It's him. Louis Charles. Thanks, Chib. How's your new book going? I'm oh, still trying to find a publisher. I've sent the manuscript around so much now, it's rather dog-eared. <laughs> Not sure many editors are convinced I've found the heir of France. I feel so close to proving it sometime, Shirley. Yet never close enough. <coughs> Are you all right? That's just tired. Too many nights on the kitchen floor. Your parents insisted I graduate to the sofa. I had such high hopes, Shirley. In my arrogance, I thought this case would make me famous. Now, I, I feel not to find an answer would be the most terrible failure. You haven't failed. You saved our lives. 
I don't know where I'd be without you. But take a break. Go on a proper holiday. No Donald. Thank you, Shirley. Come on, Harold. We're going to have a dance. Oh, really? Oh, dear. Oh, I haven't danced since 1923. Do you feel like the case took its toll on Chip Shirley? You've talked to me about those moments of him sleeping in his office and working till two o'clock in the morning. I think so, yes, yeah. Towards the end, he started to become unwell. I didn't quite know what was wrong with him, but he was having blood transfusions and Mum said he was very poorly. Chip's final note says, Donald departed this life a second time in 1968. Chip never did find a publisher for his book. That dog-eared manuscript sits here inside this cardboard box. He died of a heart attack in 1978, four days after his 78th birthday, never knowing who Donald really was. Uh... Kieran and Evelyn, we face that two-pronged path that Chip spoke of. We know from the hundreds of emails that we've received that this case has provoked incredibly strong opinions. Kieran, you called yourself a hardcore sceptic, but you said that you did believe Shirley was telling us the truth. What about now? I still believe that she is telling the truth. She believes that Donald is a poltergeist. I think she may have had a hand in it, either consciously or subconsciously at various points, but then there would have been other phenomena happening that she would have thought, no, there is something real here going on. Evelyn, we know that if this was a fraud, it was on a grand scale. I don't understand how someone was able to get away with that in a very crowded, very small house for 12 years with the whole family and Chibbet and the reporters and everybody else and nobody noticed. So this is our moment of truth. We've had so many theories from listeners and I know that you both have your own theories. Kieran, we've heard some of your ideas on possible causes for the noises, railway lines, infrasound, and your belief in the power of fear. But is this a ghost story? In my opinion, we're not dealing with a ghost story. We're dealing with a complex mix of environment and psychology. And I think with this case, I believe that there was a human hand behind it. And if you go down that particular track, you've got to think about who had something to gain from faking the phenomena. And so if we look around the front room of number 63 Wycliffe Road, all of those individuals potentially have a benefit. And I'm guessing you're going to say Shirley most of all. It's no coincidence for me that the poltergeist activity started very quickly into the period when Shirley had to go out and work. So is it a kind of response to that? But there's also a, a, a figure there who I think is in the shadows. And I think, therefore, we've got to look at John. God's sake, listen to you all, it's a flipping noise. 40 pipes or bust electrics or mice. If I was standing there and witnessing this phenomena as it was described, I would be blown away. And so somebody that's sceptical in the face of such amazing phenomena, you've got to think, does he play some responsibility in it? Or is he the person that's directing it all? Back in Ep 2, we heard him point the finger of suspicion at Shirley and Kitty. Who found the key? Who's always first to scream about things flying? And then, who called it Donald? What if it's both of them? Not feeding each other. John deflecting and pointing the finger at other people is a classic technique that I've seen in paranormal investigations. Did you hear that? And you point over in another direction at somebody else and say, yes, that's where it came from, because you're completely deflecting any attention, any blame on you. I would also like to know the relationship between Shirley and John. You know, she refers to him very fondly in the interviews. I wonder how much Shirley confided in John that she didn't want to go to work and how John ultimately may have come up with the key that prevented her 
from having to go to work. He was involved in buildings, in surveying work. He therefore could have potentially had access to an unusual key that the family weren't able to attribute to anything. Oh my God. And maybe that's the starting point, the key. Kieran, I feel like I should tell you something about John. He actually has a very complicated relationship with the family. The truth is that until John was 18, he grew up believing that he was Ethel's son. I want you to listen to this clip from Shirley. Nan attended the birth as midwife. John was born and he was then immediately put up for adoption. And my Nan said that she would adopt him. How did he find out the truth? He was called up for a uh, national service. He was 18 at the time. He wanted to be in the RAF. And the RAF had written to my gran asking for birth certificates and what have you. And, oh, he cried. He was sobbing. And then he demanded to know what what was what and then sat him down and told him. He carried that to the end of his life, I think, because he never forgave my nan for not telling him. Does this information feed into your theory, Kieran? Yes, it feeds in, but also feeds in at a totally different level. It, it makes me think that actually he's reacting to that history. You know, what's unusual about this case when you first look at it is there doesn't appear to be kind of an anger in the house. So you kind of think, well, traditionally poltergeists have that. Where is that coming from? And now you tell me more about John. Evelyn, I can see you shaking your head at all of this. What do you make of Kieran's theory? I think it's a very interesting theory, but to me it's absolutely not possible for it to be John. It's not possible for him to have created the noises that you hear like at the beginning of the case. There's also points where, you know, people come to the house to sort of interview them and whatnot. The whole family is present in the room and the sounds come from within the table and then they jump to seemingly being in the wall or the wardrobe or something and then above them in the ceiling and John is sitting right there. So how, how is it possible for him to be doing that? And it's not just the house. The noises follow Shirley to work. They also follow um, the insurance investigator that comes to the house to look at uh, the cause of the fire and things like that. So unless John is capable of being in lots of different places at once and turning invisible and floating and or flying, I just don't see how it, how it could be him. And although I don't disagree that there are points in the case that feel human-made, for John to have done this over such a long period as well and to be undetected by probably more than 50 people involved in the case is remarkable. He's a criminal genius. I think it's like we're playing Cluedo and just because I know the least about the butler doesn't mean I think it's the butler. <laughs> That's brilliant. I feel like I'm in a parapsychology rap battle. Evelyn, you have the floor. Was this a haunting? I absolutely believe that when you go through the evidence in this case, some of it cannot be attributed to environmental or you know sort of physical aspects or or people and therefore to me then i have to say okay well this is paranormal and then we have to ask ourselves what is a ghost what is your answer for that you know ghost it's something that survives past the physical body and um, then begins interacting and uh, and that's when we see these odd things that feel like magic and they feel inexplicable only because we're trying to look at them through too narrow a lens to traditional a set of beliefs. We're starting to look at whether or not consciousness is molecular and just by that I mean that it's not localised to like a physical, you know, like part of the brain. So therefore it can survive past a body you know, when it decomposes. Um, and then because it's molecular in nature, it's able to do things that seem odd, you know, it can interact and if that's true, and that is potentially what, you know, ghosts are, then it really brings me to the conclusion of having to say that this is a poltergeist case. To me, ghosts are real. It's just a question of what are they? Then you fundamentally disagree with Kieran about this being a hoax. I understand why, because I think it comes from a place of fear. People don't want to believe, you know, like that Sherlock Holmes quote, once you eliminate the impossible, whatever remains, no matter how improbable, must be the truth. Interesting. So for you, the impossible is not objects flying around the room, but that this can be explained naturally. In your opinion, this is a ghost story. 
Yes, I do believe this is a ghost story, absolutely. I promised you a solution to this mystery. We've given you two. But the most important one, I think, is the one inside your head. We live in an age where it's very hard to change people's minds. How you view the solution depends on your beliefs. But here's what I think. I believe the second half of the case was a response to the first. There's a tendency in the human brain to impose faces on the world around us. The man in the moon, the image of Jesus on a slice of burnt toast. Chaos scares us, so we try to humanise it. Whether Shirley wrote the letters consciously or unconsciously is impossible to say. I think the answer is too deeply buried now. But I believe something very strange did happen at number 63 Wycliffe Road in 1956. Something that terrified an ordinary family. And if you've been on this journey with me, I hope that you also believe that the fear that Shirley felt, still feels, is real. Evelyn posed a question, what are ghosts? And in a way, so did Kieran. Whether you think the ghost is a dead person or the product of the mysteries of the human mind depends on your beliefs. To me, both of those possibilities seem equally frightening. I believe ghosts are the cracks in our brightly lit, explainable existence. They're how the dark creeps in. I've spent a long time staring into that darkness and I think it's time to close this box up and open these blinds. What are you guys doing? Dancing. <laughs> Can I come on the trampoline? Dancing. Yeah. Daddy, I'm the Mandalorian. He has the baby Yoda. But there's someone who can't forget this case, who cannot neatly close the box. The last time I spoke to Shirley, she ended our interview with a story that sent a little shiver down my spine. It's the late 1980s. Shirley and Derek are raising their kids in a small town on the south coast of England. Shirley has joined the local Women's Institute and is helping out at their craft fair in a church hall when she's approached by a woman called Agnes. She was on the card stall. She came over once to me because she was a bit creepy and she said, Do you know I'm a medium? I said, no, I didn't. I think it was the first time I'd spoken to her. So she said... Uh, I need to speak to you. Agnes very definitely doesn't know about Donald. Shirley's been careful not to tell anyone in her new hometown. Have you got a little brother who's departed? And I said, no, no. She said, you sure? There's a little boy, and when you cross this hall, he's behind you. He's dressed in fancy dress, blue satin and lace, and he's got red hair. I said, no, no, Agnes, sorry. Oh, but he follows you everywhere. And I I deliberately said, no, Agnes, you're wrong. Sorry. And I, I went to walk away. I said, no. Did you recognise that description? Yeah, I got a little postcard from Paris and he's in a blue satin suit and he's got red hair. It's him. Louis Charles. With any good ghost story, there is always just enough room for doubt. Maybe the Battersea poltergeist isn't a cold case after all. Perhaps Donald is out there still, waiting, ready to make contact again.
Poltergeist was written and presented by me, Danny Robbins. It was co-produced by me and Simon Barnard. Simon directed the drama sections, which starred Daphne Keane as Shirley and Toby Jones as Harold Chibbert. With Bern Gorman as Wally Hitchings, Alice Lowe as Kitty, Sorica Kusak as Ethel and Calvin Denver as John. Casey Ainsworth played Lily Chibbert, Rufus Wright was Ronald Maxwell, Miranda Rayson was Joyce Lewis and David Troughton played Harry Hanks. Dan Starkey was John Knight and other parts were played by Amina Zia, Lizzie Roper, Stephen Critchlow and Becky Wright. Our experts were Kieran O'Keefe and Evelyn Hollow. Editing sound design was by Richard Fox with additional editing by Charlie Brandon King. Music was by Evelyn Sykes. Our theme music, Hold of Me, was specially composed by the brilliant Nadine Shah and Ben Hillier. Our artwork was designed by Tom Saunders. Consultant on the series was Alan Murdy. Special thanks to James Clark, co-author of The Poltergeist Prince of London, for all his help with research. To Derek Hitchings and to all the intriguing people I interviewed. But of course, thank you most of all to the remarkable Shirley Hitchings for trusting me with her story. This was a Baffle Gap production for BBC Radio 4. The commissioning editor was Rianne Roberts and the commissioning executive was Paula MacDonald. This is not quite the end of the investigation. We're taking a very short break and then there will be an episode nine. We'll be discussing aspects of the case in more detail, looking at your theories and we'll put your questions to Shirley herself. So if you want to take part, email us at batterseapoltergeist at bbc.co.uk. Until next time, sleep well. Don't have nightmares. <laughs>